So in saying that, it's my honor to introduce uh, Dr. Paul McClure. Dr. McClure is a assistant professor and chair of the Department of Sociology and Human Services. He holds a BA in philosophy from our evil old act rival, Washington, and insert whatever you would like with that second Anderson <laughs> University. Uh, a master's degree in theological studies from Regent College in lovely Vancouver, Canada. Canada. Uh, you know, it would probably help if I put my glasses on, Paul. I apologize for trying to read on memory. Um, and a PhD in sociology from Baylor University. Paul is now in his sixth year at the University of Lynchburg, where he has taught a total of 13 different courses. But when he's not prepping or teaching one of those courses, he does research in the areas of technology, religion, and culture. His research appears in such journals as Poetics, Social Science Computer Review, Sociological Perspectives, Implicit Re Religion, and the Journal of Scientific Study, to which I believe there have been over 500 citations. Was the number Paul? In total. In total, correctly, so well done. And these publications have been featured in over 50 news outlets worldwide, including Forbes in USA Today. Uh, his talk is entitled, Organized Spirituality, Dispatches from Silicon Valley. So please let me welcome Dr. Paul McClure. team for Cassie, Sarah, and Jeff uh, for this great invitation. Um, when they first reached out to me and asked if I wanted to present some of my research uh, this spring, I thought about it and I said, um, you know, I don't know if I have really like the time right now or the, the incentive. I'm teaching five classes. I'm on some committees. We're running a search this semester and I just don't know, you know, what I can do or if there is incentive here. And, and Jeff said, um, well, Paul will, will pay you <laughs> with a free lunch at the end of the semester. <laughs> so, so it's awesome. Uh, do you recognize this man? This is arguably one of the most influential people in the world that you don't recognize. In 1971, when he was much younger and some 20 years before the launch of what was called the World Wide Web. This man, an eccentric writer and technologist, was living in Menlo Park, California, when the region was formally declared for the first time Sil Silicon Valley. <clears throat> he went there purposefully, according to his journal notes, a few years before this, because he wanted his technology to happen there. In 1974, so 50 years ago, this man coined the term personal computer, which at the time was a rather odd expression. Computers back then were rather large, clunky items, limited in their capacity by today's standards, and very few individuals possessed them or even wanted them. The first computers, as you know, were huge. They took up entire university basements, and they weren't owned by persons, but by colleges or corporations or the military. And they were symbolic of cold, impersonal data analysis and corporate bureaucracy. But this man had more foresight and optimism than most. He anticipated a day when we would all have them or want them. Fast forward to 2005, the year I graduated from college, and this man was mentioned in a commencement address given by none other than the founder of Apple, Steve Jobs, who in his address to Stanford graduates said that it was this man who was a major influence in his life. Any takers? Jobs credited this man with changing his life because of a certain publication seen here, uh, called the Whole Earth Catalog, and its successor, the Last Whole Earth Catalog. It's a very peculiar publication. Uh, 
Jobs, again, in his speech at Stanford, likened it to an early version of Google in paperback form and said it was, quote, idealistic and overflowing with neat tools and great notions. The subtitle of the publication, if you can see it there, says, Access to Tools. And at the beginning of the catalog, this man, whose name, he's younger here, whose name is Stuart Brand, issued these words, we are as gods and might as well get good at it. It was, and I think still is, a kind of puzzling expression. Why would a pioneer of the coming digital revolution invoke the gods or equate himself to one when writing about the latest technological trends and tools? Brand's words seem even more out of place when viewed from the Western perspective of social scientists, long versed in the theory of secularization. Now, many theorists have predicted that science and technology would replace religion. As technology advan uh, advances, uh, religion vanishes. As the sociologist Peter Berger once quipped, a sky empty of angels becomes open to the intervention of the astronomer and then eventually the astronaut. Uh, curiously enough, um, the iconic cover of Brand's publication, the Whole Earth Catalog, and its successor, the last Whole Earth Catalog, displays some of the first publicly available photographs ever taken of Earth from outer space. But that was not the prediction of many Western social scientists. Peter Berger and others were confident then as the world became more technologically advanced, the angels and gods of whom we spoke would fade into the background. Now, seen from a different perspective, this is an aerial overview of uh, Silicon Valley, a stretch of land south of San Francisco in the Bay Area that is home to the most powerful and influential tech companies in the world. And when Brand moved into this region around Menlo Park, California, in the late 1960s, there were no technology companies that we know of today. There was no Microsoft, there was no Facebook, there was no Apple, there was no Google. So one of my focal points in my research and in my talk today is digital technology and its impact on our world. The influence of the technology that comes out of Silicon Valley is not confined to this circle, and it impacts our social lives greatly. Or uh, put differently, uh, what happens in Silicon Valley does not stay in Silicon Valley. Uh, the second research interest of mine relates to spirituality, and particularly those who say they are spiritual but not religious. A data here from the Pew Research Center in 2023 showed that nearly a quarter of Americans today say they are spiritual but not religious. Now more Americans, and you can see this, uh, say they are both religious and spiritual, but that percentage has been on the decline in recent years, whereas the percentage of Americans who consider themselves spiritual but not religious is on the ascension. And this is true for lots of groups. This is true for women and men. It's true across different racial and ethnic groups. And it's even true among Democrats and Republicans. They actually have something in common, if you can believe it. <laughs> so these findings, uh, I think, deserve explanation. They require further attention with respect to what is happening across the religious landscape in North America. Uh, so my research agenda, uh, broadly speaking, uh, aims to explore how changes in the religious or spiritual landscape in North America are potentially related to technological developments. To what extent, then, are changes in religion possibly impacted by what's going on in Silicon Valley. If digital technology touches almost all parts of our lives today, from our attention spans to our sleep patterns, 
uh, to our politics and communal life, why would our religious traditions, our beliefs, our practices somehow be immune from that? Or put another way, how is time spent in front of a screen or working in a tech company associated with changes in American religion? Uh, with this research agenda now in view for us, uh, I should say something about the word spirituality, because that's not an easy word to understand. It's hard to pin down. And as the title of my topic uh, suggests, I do think there's a connection between spirituality and technology that often goes unnoticed. Uh, but beyond that, I think there are many common assumptions about spirituality that deserve further scrutiny. So first, the first is that spirituality uh, is mostly a private affair and rarely is it seen in public. Religion uh, might be public or institutionalized, but spirituality is often positioned against that and seen as more of a private, uh, less public matter. Uh, a second assumption about spirituality is that it's a personal concern and that it's inappropriate or uncommon for it to be brought into the work in other words, uh, the assumption uh, that I think many people make is that spirituality is personal and seldom professional. A third assumption is that spirituality is more open-ended, less defined, more inclusive, and never does it exclude specific beliefs, practices, or habits. Maybe religion does that. Maybe religion excludes with its dogmatic truths as the thinking goes, but not spirituality. A fourth assumption is that spirituality is unbounded or borderless and does not have defined limits. It expands, but doesn't contract or exclude. And tying all these together, the central claim or assumption that is often made is that spirituality is somewhat disorganized and not organized, like religion might. In fact, when you saw the topic of today's talk, I'm guessing you thought it was kind of odd. Organized spirituality, you know, what is that? You've heard of organized religion before, but not organized spirituality. The problem, though, with these assumptions is that they're wrong. And as I'm going to claim today, you can see this most prominently in Silicon Valley, especially with a text like this one, Search inside yourself the unexpected path to achieving success, happiness, and world peace by Chade Ming Tan, who is a former Google engineer and now international bestseller, movie producer, and philanthropist. In Tan's career at Google, he moved from an engineering position to people operations and was the pioneer behind their Search Inside Yourself leadership Institute, or SILI is the acronym is. Uh, his job description, according to his own website, was to enlighten minds, open hearts, and create world peace. That is an ambitious job description, is it not? So we have here at Google uh, the rather odd confluence of spirituality and work at Google and in other tech companies in Silicon Valley spirituality is not meant to be private or personal. It's meant to be public, shared, professional, and part of the organization's stated attempt to change the world. In other words, that spirituality is getting institutionalized in corporate tech culture. And I should say that I'm not the only one to make these observations. Uh, the Stanford professor Communications, Fred Turner discusses the history of Silicon Valley, Valley in his magnificent book, From Counterculture to Cyberculture, Stuart Brand, The Whole Earth Network, and the Rise of Digital Utopianism. And more recently, and I'm currently reviewing this book for a journal, uh, the UC Berkeley sociologist, Carolyn Shin, has documented the corporate tech culture in her book uh, with this good title, Work, Pray, Code, 
when work becomes religion in Silicon Valley. Both are excellent resources, and if you're interested, I commend them to you. Without them, I doubt my research uh, would be where it is. For my own part in all this, uh, however, um, I looked at the pages of the popular publication, Wired Magazine. Founded in 1993, Wired bills itself as the premier technology magazine in the United States. It's a successor in many ways to what Stuart Brand was doing with the Whole Earth Catalog. And so it's not an accident that you see a very similar appearance in that first issue of uh, Wired to what Brand was doing with the Whole Earth Catalog. And if you read this magazine today, along with its 892,000 monthly <laughs> subscribers, you'll also see that spirituality and religion are not infrequently discussed. In these cover pages of Wired, the general pattern is to feature a person, whether that's Steve Jobs or the inventor Ray Kurzweil, who's actively, as it says here, trying to live forever, uh, or Mark Zuckerberg, or Bill Gates, who's trying to save the world. It looks like Ray Kurzweil and Bill Gates are trying to save the world. You can see that. Um, or some other public figure. These are a sample, this is a sample of wired cover pages across the years. So religion and spirituality are obviously not the, the sole focus of why. Of course not. Uh, it's a primarily a magazine about technology and culture. But amidst these issues, occasionally you see others pop up, like these. So from June 1997, an issue from Wired shows the iconic Apple logo surrounded by a crown of thorns with the statement, Bray. A few years later, in 2002, they ran an entire issue on the connections between science and religion. You can see here a cross, a Christian cross with swirling electrons around it. And then, uh, here in the middle, from November of 2007, you see an issue with the title, The New Atheism. The subtitle reads, No Heaven, No Hell, Just Science. So what's going on here? The magazine is not just reviewing new computers or iPhones. It's not just about gadgets. Why is the most read, most published magazine in the heart of Silicon Valley talking about prayer and atheism and religion? This became the focus of my research for this project. And so the more specific research question here is how do the writers at Wired and the reporters that do the work there discuss and portray religion and spirituality in their articles? They don't write about religion and spirituality all the time because that's not their focus. But when they do, what do they do? And how do they talk about it? So to do this, I needed some data. And the data for my project begin with Wired issues from the year 2001, an earlier publication by Steph Offers at the University of Leuven in Belgium, focused on Wired issues from 1993 to 2000. And so my analysis picks up here and runs from 2001 to 2020. And customary with projects of this nature, I've limited my sample size by randomly choosing three issues from each year. Is made for a total of 60 issues of Wire magazine, and I used a random number generator to determine which year to read and analyze in my sample. So if the random number generator uh, spat out the number one, then uh, I would read and analyze the January issue of that year, and if it produced the number 12, uh, then I would read and analyze the December issue of that year. I didn't read everything in those issues. I mostly focused on lengthy uh, feature articles that were highlighted on the cover or prominently displayed in the table of contents. And in total, uh, there were nearly 400 articles that were reviewed. And over 100 of these included prominent religious or spiritual terms at some point in the article. So that was over 28% of the sample, the initial sample. And after reviewing the content of these articles, 
Another 46 articles were then pulled aside because they were primarily about religion, spirituality, and technology. And these articles didn't just mention religion or spirituality in passing, um, they were heavily focused on them. And so these were then examined through a research method called discourse analysis. Uh, pictured another way, um, and actually this is, this is a, a, an issue uh, that randomly ended, ended up in my sample and contains several religious uh, and, and spiritual themes throughout. You can see this on the cover, right? A, a divine digital hand descending from the clouds uh, to show us the one true way. Um, illustrated in a different way, I started with all the issues of Wired Magazine from 2001 to 2020, then I randomly selected three issues for each year for a total of 60 issues. Uh, 104 of these articles contained significant religious and spiritual language in them, and then 46 articles ended up being analyzed for their various motifs, themes, or frames. And that emerged from those articles to show that they were primarily about religion, spirituality, and technology. Um, here is the first table. Uh, it gives you a glimpse of the larger body of articles that contain religious or spiritual terms. Uh, let me come back here. Okay. And in conducting uh, the content analysis, articles were scanned for general religious or spiritual terminology. And so I looked for terms like God, deity, divine, religion, religious, spiritual, Spirituality, heaven, hell, church, temple, prayer, faith, holy, Christian, Muslim, Jewish, Judeo-Christian, Jesus, evangelical, supernatural, sacred, and others. If the articles were online, uh, which most were, I could run a quick control F search and see if any of those words hit and were present in the articles. And occasionally, while searching and finding those words, other phrases were discovered and documented in the process, such as the Catholic Church, Virgin Mary, Protestant, Old Testament, Tibetan Buddhist doctrine, Hindu, prophet, theological, blasphemy, idolatry, apocalyptic, jihadists, angels, demons, Mennonites, the Mormon Church, crosses, monks, creationists, fundamentalism, nirvana, New Age, and so forth. It was frankly amazing seeing so many articles in Wired magazine, which is purportedly solely about technology and culture, invoke supernatural or spiritual terms. And most of the time, the references to these items uh, were largely positive. Uh, we found 64 articles that contained positive mentions of religion and spirituality, and fewer articles, 35 of them, were portrayed in a negative light. And then there were a few articles we discovered where there was a mixed, ambiguous, or neutral uh, depiction of religion or spirituality. Uh, as helpful as it is to explain, maybe, the quick sentiments of wired writers and technologists who mention religion and spiritual terms in their articles, a second step in this project was to examine those articles that were primarily about religion or spirituality. And some definite trends emerged. Some of the articles in Wired, when they talk about religion or spirituality, like this issue, uh, do so under the banner of conflict. Religion versus science. Spirituality is superstition. An issue from uh, November 2007, as you can see here, claims there is no heaven, no hell, just science. And religion, when it is portrayed or discussed here, is seen as an obstacle to various things. It's seen as an obstacle to global civilization, it's seen as an obstacle to public school theories and teaching of evolution, it's seen as an obstacle to biotechnology and genetic engineering, liberal democracy and the advancement of civil rights, or just basically scientific progress in general. From this perspective, which 
uh, we call a conflict motif, and which was found in 23.9% of the articles in the subsample. Organized religion is problematic and needs to be done away with so that the technologists and scientists can go about their jobs and do good things. And again, this was a definite motif that surfaced occasionally in the pages of Wired, but it was not the only one. So for a second motif that was discovered, uh, we can find this in what I call the compatible motif. And here, um, the thinking is that religion and technology are not at loggerheads or in tension with each other. In fact, from this perspective, religion and technology are entirely compatible with one another and for various reasons. So for example, prominent scientists who are religious such as Francis Collins, are featured in some Wired articles and argue for the reconciliation between science and religion. In one article entitled, The Pope's Astrophysicist. Did y'all know the Pope had an astrophysicist? I want one. Um, the writer Margaret Wertheim favorably covers the life and thoughts of Father George Coyne who was the director and senior scientist at the Vatican Observatory. Other articles explore the religious implications of scientific theories or show how religious professionals interact positively with technology and science. A Wired writer interviews a theologian at Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary who believes that genetic engineering for humans is a natural extension of God's will. And according to this theologian, quote, we are responsible for making the world a better place, and technology is one means whereby we can do it. So you can see a second type of motif emerging in articles like these. Finally, though, as a departure to these earlier framing strategies, a third motif articulates a narrative where technology is the supreme fulfillment of specific spiritual beliefs, ideals, and practices. Now, most of the Wired articles that bring religion or spirituality into the story not only use this motif, but they also deploy a particular discourse that undermines organized religion in favor of an alternative spirituality. So, for example, uh, in an article about an underground rogue scientist known only as the creator, a Wired reporter named Brian Alexander follows the fulfillment motif when discussing the intentions of the scientist who wants to clone human beings. As the creator mentioned in this article states, this will be the biggest leap for mankind. It is the central core of Christianity the resurrection of Jesus, the promise of eternal life. And aside from the science or ethics of human cloning, it's interesting that this celebrated underground scientist reworks a story, a biblical story, to be about human cloning. Any of the articles that mention the inventor, uh, Ray Kurzweil, as well, who is very open about his transhumanist desire merge his body with AI interfaces and live forever, follow a similar trajectory. And so the arguments go like this. Uh, technology is the fulfillment of religion and spirituality because humans will achieve immortality through technological innovation. Or, in a disenchanted world, technology can re-enchant a disenchanted world. Or, the universe is basically a big machine, and we need to understand it in that way. This is another spin-off on this motif, and several articles I discovered make the ambitious claim that the best way to understand the world we live in is through the metaphor of computation. This idea comes from Kevin Kelly. He was a Stuart Brand acolyte and the former editor of Wired Magazine. And according to Kelly, the universe should be thought of as one big gigantic computer. 
So in an article of his entitled, God is the Machine, Kel Kel let's try it again. Kevin Kelly writes this. Computation seems almost a theological process. It takes as its fodder the primeval choice between yes or no, the fundamental state of one or zero. After stripping away all externalities, all material embellishments, what remains is the purest state of existence. Here, not here. Am, not am. In the Old Testament, when Moses asked the Creator, who are you? The being says, in effect, am. One bit, one almighty bit. Yes, one exists. It is the simplest statement possible. So, as this passage illustrates, Kelly is reinterpreting the Old Testament and recasting it in a meaning so that technology is the fulfillment and means to achieve pure spiritual liberation. Find that passage. There are limitations uh, to this study uh, that I should point out before I conclude and start to wrap up. So first, with uh, qualitative projects like this, there are inevitably difficulties with interpretation, and some subjectivity is unavoidable. However, I try to mitigate any kind of unwarranted bias by adding research assistance and another co-author to keep this work in check and on track. A second point worth mentioning is that I used a random uh, number generator to determine which issues and month months to analyze. Uh, but had I randomly selected different months, it's possible that my findings would have been a little different, or at least there would have been different percentages within the content and discourse uh, analysis. And then finally, there's usually the question of authorial intent that surfaces in a discussion like this. That is, do the authors themselves mean to follow these motifs of conflict, compatibility, or fulfillment? That's certainly an interesting question, uh, but it's also not evident, to me at least, that that's the only thing that matters. As long as the data conform to the categories and motifs that I've proposed here, then we're on hopefully solid analytical ground, even if the religious landscape is changing beneath our feet. So what does this mean? Uh, wired writers are actively talking about religion and spirituality. Not all the time, of course, but when they do, they're using religious and spiritual terms, vocabulary, and concepts, oftentimes in service of showcasing new technological advancements and a new kind of culture that is emerging with each passing year. Spirituality is very popular in Silicon Valley, but it is no longer merely private, personal, inclusive, borderless, or disorganized. And so what I'm arguing today is that instead, we need to rethink it and see it for what it is, at least in Silicon Valley. It's public, professional, exclusive, bounded, and organized. Okay, uh, before I wrap up or take any questions, uh, I'd love to highlight some people that were very influential in helping me complete this work. So first, uh, I'd like to thank the University of Lynchburg um, for uh, supporting me with the generous summer research grant that allowed me to present the nearly final version of this research at a conference in Portland, Oregon. Uh, second, I really benefited from the research assistance of one of our own graduates. Hunter Epperson, if you're out there, uh, Hunter graduated in 2022 with a major in comm studies and a minor in sociology. Uh, he approached me towards the end of his tenure here and was wondering if he could do an independent study. And at that time, I had not coded the years 2013 to 2020 of this publication wired. I had coded the first 12 years, 
but he really helped move this project across the finish line with his infectious enthusiasm. So thank you, Hunter. Uh, third, Chris Piper of Baylor University has sat uh, patiently and watched this project nearly die on multiple occasions. And so without his support and critical advice at a few different junctures, I don't think it would have happened. And for that, he's also a co-author on this article. Uh, and then finally, um, I want to thank Steph Offers for his earlier work on this subject, uh, as well as Dick Kaufman and Galen Watts, uh, who saved it from the trash heap. I, had, um, I, I don't think I was going to mention this earlier, but when I first submitted this article for publication, I sent it out to a prominent journal and waited around for 13 months before they got back to me and said, oh, we couldn't find anybody to read it. So here you go. And they just sent it back to me. So frustrated, I thought, okay, well, what are we gonna do with this now? And about a week later, Galen Watts, who's now at the University of Waterloo, but at the time he was at the University of Leuven, reached out to me and said, Paul, I'm working on a book with Dick Kaufman, and I would love to know if you have any contributions. The book is now uh, in press. It's called The Shape of Spirituality, The Public Significance of a New Religious Formation. It's published by Columbia University Press, or will be, and hopefully it should be out uh, next year. And so this is going to be chapter five of that book. Um, but again, I wanna thank the research team and everyone for uh, in coming out to hear this. Uh, I'm happy to take questions in the time that I have remaining. Um, thank you so much. Thank you.